Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. Today, you're just about to learn things that you were definitely not taught at school, and certainly not by your boring old teachers. Ancient Egypt isn't just about hieroglyphs, pyramids, pharaohs, and creepy mummies coming back to life. Sex played an important role in the life and religion of ancient Egypt. We're here today to tell you just how kinky their sex lives really got. In Egyptian mythology, deities were known to marry their siblings. Geb, god of the earth, coupled with his twin sister, Nut, goddess of the sky. Seth, the god of war, married his sister, Nethys, goddess of peace and harmony. Isis, goddess of fertility, of course, could never get enough of her brother Osiris. Seth chopped his brother Osiris into small pieces, but Isis missed him so much, she brought him back to life so she could continue their romance. Horus, the falcon god, and his uncle Seth were vying for the throne of Egypt. One evening, Horus pretended to be intoxicated. Seth tried to rape and humiliate him, but Horus caught his semen just in time and shoved it to his mother, Isis. So what did Seth's sister do? She cut off his hands, tossed him off into a jar, and chucked all that creamy goo into the river Nile. Kinky, isn't it? Egyptian royalty carried on this tradition by attempting to keep their bloodlines pure by not marrying outside the family. It was not considered taboo for royal brothers and sisters to engage in premarital sex. The father and mother of King Tutankhamun were brother and sister, creating a long line of inbreeding that caused serious genetic illnesses, malformations and infections. These incestuous relations were not exclusive to the ruling class, it occurred in the general population too. Incest ruled in Upper and Lower Egypt. Atum is the name of the first Egyptian god. He created himself and all of his children. He didn't need a wife for that. He quite literally did it all himself. He masturbated and gave birth too, to Shu and Tefnut. How clever is that? The ancient Egyptians called this the Hand of God. Royal women of the 18th dynasty bore the title the Hand of God. Daughters of Nubian kings ruling Egypt during the 25th dynasty also bore this title. These daughters of the Hand of God played a crucial role in the empire. During the Greco-Roman period, the Hand of God is linked to goddesses, but it all began with a divine act of masturbation. In pharaonic times, women would sing songs describing each other's bodies lustfully. One of them goes like this. The one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all, she looks like the rising morning star at the start of a happy year. Shining bright, fair as skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty, with her graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart by her movements hot, isn't it? Min is the god of male fertility. At the Luxor temple, Upper Egypt, Min has been drawn with a feathered headdress and permanently erect phallus. Men having impotency problems made phallic figures and offered them to Min. They were hoping that their erectile problems would come to an end, that their sexual performance would suddenly improve, that they would be healed and their male egos restored. The drawings of Min are darker than others, that's because so many desperate lovers have touched them with their fingers. Both men and women believe that if they touch the picture of Min's phallus, their fertility issues would evaporate. Over time, all the touching has stained the paintings brown. The fertility god Min is connected to lettuce. Strange, isn't it, to associate one of life's greatest but most elusive pleasures to a salad. Lettuce in ancient Egypt had a white milky sap that resembled semen. In March 1998, Hillary Clinton visited Luxor Temple. This happened shortly after Bill Clinton's impeachment and Monica Lewinsky's scandal, also involving semen. Ray Johnson, director of the University of Chicago's diggings in Luxor, pointed at the phallus of the Godmen and declared, this is where it all began, the Big Bang. Poor Hillary.
adultery flourished in ancient Egypt. Proof of this is cited at the builder's village of Deir el Medina in the Valley of the Kings. A papyrus scroll has been found dating back to the year 29 of the Pharaoh Ramesses III. Paneb, an official in charge of the building of tombs, engaged in all kinds of nefarious behaviours, including corruption, theft, fighting, and, of course, adultery. He had sexual relations with prodigious numbers of both married and unmarried women. The charges against him were heavy. Paneb slept with the Lady Twy when she was the wife of the workman Quena. He slept with the Lady Hel when she was with Pen Dua. He slept with the Lady Hel when she was Hezi Su Neb F. And when he had slept with Hel, he slept with Webhakat, her daughter, and Apokathe, his son, slept with Webhakat himself. So it wasn't just Paneb, it was his son too. These ancient Egyptians clearly enjoyed sex whenever and wherever they could get their hands on it. From 1479 to 1425 BC, there was a specific type of headpiece worn by women for a specific purpose. The headpiece is a wig with dreadlocks and a gold headdress. In Egyptian literature and culture, women are portrayed as seductresses. Guess you remember the tale of Joseph and the wife of Pophetar, the captain of the pharaoh's guard? This desperate, sex-crazed harlot did everything under the sun to get her lustful hands on him. The tale of the two brothers tells a similar tale. Barta lived with his brother Anu and his sister-in-law. One day, Barta, carrying sacks of grain into their home, and who isn't at home, but his wife is, she's plaiting her hair and noticing all the sacks that Batu's carrying. She told him that he was strong. She tried to seduce him, but he rejected her advances. Bata decided not to tell his brother of her mischief, but his sister-in-law panicked. She painted bruises on her face, pretend that Bata had battered her. The moment her husband returned, she told him that his brother did this to her, and tried to seduce her. She told Ampu that Bata forced her to put on her erotic wig because he wanted to sleep with her, but she refused him. Bata told Ampu the truth, cut off his own penis, threw it into the river for fish to eat. Ampu murdered his wife and fed her to their dogs. Only the dogs benefited from all these sexual shenanigans. From murals and papyrus, it is understood that impotence and infertility are a massive problem in ancient Egypt. The causes were both physical and psychological. The ancient Egyptian sage, Oshenshogi, passed this golden rule onto his descendants in one of his wisdom texts. He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get children. Makes sense, doesn't it? Ancient Egyptians believed in curses and that they could be cursed by sexual rivals. These curses could block a person from maintaining an erection. Imagine how humiliating that could be. Evildoers could cast spells like this just by tying knots or fish in the right way. This goes back to a story of the two brothers who we just spoke about and a batter's penis that got swallowed by a fish. But people also used magic to attract partners by the use of voodoo dolls. People either made voodoo dolls themselves, or they had a magician make one. If a man really liked a woman, he could make a voodoo doll of her so that no other man would want her or pursue her. The figurine would be pierced with bronze nails and a spell would be inscribed on a lead tablet. The spell could ward off anyone to eat, drink or be with the woman. She could only be with the man casting the spell. The magic text summons a demon that pulls the woman by her hair and intestines until she comes to him. Please don't try this at home. Imagine how bad you would feel if it actually worked. You might think of porn as something modern and connected to the internet, but it has been around for thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians couldn't live without it. The Turin Papyrus is from 1150 BCE and can be found at the Museo Egeo in Turin. This ancient erotic scroll depicts a small, balding, paunchy, scruffy and highly unappetising man having intercourse with a beautiful woman. They're trying out different positions. They don't exactly know why this papyrus came to be, but it's believed to be a political satire because of the numerous vignettes of animals in human roles on the same papyrus. It also mocks people from the upper class. Others that might know better from personal experience and taste consider this papyrus to be pure porn. So, the Turin papyrus remains an important document to those dedicated scholars still struggling to understand the true nature of sex in ancient Egypt.
ancient Egyptians supposedly engaged in sexual relations with dogs, cows and even crocodiles. These acts, however, were condemned and punishable with high penalties, torture and death. Drawings on tombs and their hieroglyphs demonstrate sexual acts towards animals. These acts were either penetrative or external. Bestiality is also used in their religious practices. Ancient Egyptians glorified sexual acts between people and bulls or goats. These were holy acts, doors to the beyond. Egyptian kings and queens also engaged in zoophilia. Men were the principal agents of bestiality, since it's easier for them. They mainly engaged with cattle and other domesticated animals. Guess crocodiles could be a little daunting at times. If zoophilia isn't horrifying enough, necrophilia is even more shocking. In Egyptian mythology, Seth kills Osiris and dismembers him. Osiris' sister-wife, Isis, sets out to collect his body parts. She found them all, apart from the most important one, his penis, of course. Being a goddess, Isis easily created a brand new one for the love of her life. He was restored and once again slept with his wife and sister at the same time. Isis then conceived Horus. This heartwarming story suggests that our sexual power even survives death. This justified and promoted necrophilia. The great 5th century BC historian Herodotus who wrote that people deliberately avoided delivering corpses to embalmers for a few days so that they could not be copulated with. Very kinky, these ancient Egyptians. What do you all think? <laughs>